This is, uh, this is our regular, uh, for those who haven't been here before, this is our regular monthly uh, lecture series that we do here. Um, I'm Frank O'Brien. I'm a solar system ambassador for NASA. This is a purely volunteer uh, organization. There's about 900 of us. Uh, we're all across the country, and yes, we might be going out with your daughters or something silly like that. The important thing is, is that it's really, we're the face of NASA to the community. And I have a very, very big thing about uh, giving back to communities and all the rest. I've lived a good life. I'm retiring on, Monday, on Tuesday. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I can't take it with me. And so it's real important for me to be able to do this kind of stuff. Been doing it 25 years. I can't see a reason for stopping. And I'm just really, really glad that you're here. So we talk about mostly space topics here. There's always some good things to talk of. Does anyone know what's going to be happening this July? Big events. All right, OK. What's the other big thing going on in July? It'll be 50 years since we landed on the moon. That's amazing stuff. But we're going to be doing something just a little, every time we try doing a little bit different. One of the things this time to say, you're going to be getting a little bit more history. Now, as we were talking outside, and you folks didn't hear, we talk of this grand organization called NASA. Now, you know the answer to this, but what's NASA stand for? Go to the head of the class. National Aeronautics and Space Administration. We talk about all the space stuff so far. We have for you know, the last few years that I've been doing these talks. Let's talk about that first A in NASA. Aviation's been around a lot longer than space flight. And NASA has done huge things in just about every aspect of it. Can you guys over there see the screen? I know it's a little bit of a sharp angle and all the rest because we have tons of seats over here. Fair enough. One thing to remember. You step on a jetliner for the last, well, 100 years. Maybe not jetliners 100 years ago. But just about every major advance in aviation has been done through NASA or its predecessor, something called NACA. What's a NACA? Got to have the pretty picture. It's the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. This came in right around the middle of the first war. Believe it or not, we think of ourselves as a leading, a leading country in aerospace and all the rest, and we are. During this first war, we were also ran. The British and the French and the Germans were just beating our pants off. We were you know, just having our plane shot out of the sky because they were lousy airplanes. We had to use the, the British and uh, French planes. We were really dying to do good aviation. Well. That was created. There's a base right near, uh, I think it's in Newport News. It's right near Virginia Beach, if, you, if you're familiar with the area. It's Langley Air Force Base. This is where it all started. Ended up moving to different locations, different sites that specialized in things. Basic research was done at Langley. Research in propellers. Yeah, well, you know, again, it was first war. Propellers were a thing. That was done in Ohio. And later on, we started doing our high-speed flight research. We're going to talk about that. And that's over at Edwards Air Force Base. I, I lived not too far from that years ago when I was a kid. I normally never, not as, a, not as an emotional thing, but these talks generally aren't those where you talk about people and personalities and big biographies. But I'm going to take a break from that. There's one person you should know because he came that close to being a household name. Bigger household name than a couple knuckleheads from Ohio. Sam Langley. Even before he started doing what we were just going to uh, start mentioning, Samuel Langley was a noted astronomer, invented an incredibly important instrument that we use today called a bolometer. We use it to measure all the heat coming off of stars. Still in use today. 
He was the, one of the first directors of the Smithsonian. And at the time, and this is you know, the late 1800s, at the time, the Smithsonian wasn't a museum the way we think of today. It was kind of like a philanthropy, research-based thing. If you had a project that was science-oriented, you'd go to the Guggenheim uh, funds, you'd go to the uh, uh, Smithsonian for your money so you could do your research. It was only until later in the 20th century, or you know, later once we got into the 20th century, that it became the museum that we think of today. So he was one of the first directors. So he's got this science, he's a physicist, and he wanted to solve the problems of flight. We've all seen way too many times those little newsreel clips of these impossibly silly flying machines. And they usually go a couple feet and they break up or some poor guy jumps off the Eiffel Tower and goes splat and that kind of stuff. That is the popular image of early aviation research. There was no research going on. It was a bunch of guys working in garages at best. Samuel Langley went to go and do the basic research on flight. They came that close. 1896, this is seven years before the Wright brothers. He had one of his first aer aerodromes flying. Flew for about half an hour, flew lots of times, up to 5,000 feet. Great piece of trivia, you know who took that picture? One of the pioneers in photography, and you don't know this? Alexander Graham Bell. Told you, you gotta watch out, you might learn something. Anyway, so yeah, this was, this was flying seven years before the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers were very familiar with his work if you want to paint it as a competition between the Wright brothers and Langley, it was neck and neck. Because just, just a couple months before the Wright brothers flew, he was, already do, he was already planning to do manned aviation. Small little problems, aside from the fact it went right into the Potomac. It's a bad day at work. He didn't do the basic research on wings. He actually had an incredibly powerful engine in all of these. 50 horsepower steam engine. Imagine that. Didn't have structures nailed down. And the key thing, even if he did fly, all you could do is go in a straight line because he hadn't mastered, as, as was the breakthrough with the Wright brothers, the ability to control your aircraft. Turns going up, down on your command. It didn't exist in this. So you could say if this flew, this is what, again his manned aerodrome, you could say that yes, he had sustained heavier than air flight. That would have been very correct. And again, like the one he had years before, probably fly forever. But by God, you try getting out of the way of something when you try, if you can figure out how to land it, all the rest. Believe it or not, another personality, another name that might be obscure, Curtis Wright. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Glenn Curtis. Bankrupted the, uh, the Wright brothers through little legal challenges. First thing the Wright brothers did after they sent the telegram that said we flew was that they patented everything. Curtis was there going, I'm not so sure he was good about stealing patents. He had a very successful airplane company. Broke the Wright brothers. And to do that, he wanted to prove that the Wright brothers didn't invent the airplane. Because then that would invalidate all of it. He actually re you know, he got the scraps of this aerodrome and got it to fly. Patents were upheld, but it did fly. Substantially redesigned, but it worked. So anyway, that's, a, that's so much of our history lesson. The whole idea of aviation research is the tools that you use. We have something called CFD, computational fluid dynamics. We don't need to worry about all the gobbledygook. This is where we take the horsepower of a ton 
literally hundreds of thousands at times, now what we do today. Thousands of processors doing the equations of aviation motion. The design of the airplane, the, fl uh, the flow of the wings. We do this today as a matter of course. You can go out, spend a lot of money, buy a package, software package, and it's just fabulous. There was no concept of that right after the first war. And so we built wind tunnels. And this is how research was done on aviation in the, in, well, even today. Even today, computational fluid dynamics fall short on a lot of problems, turbulence in particular. Um, but now, instead of like hammering all this stuff together in a garage, taking it outside, crossing your fingers and hope you don't break a lot of bones, you can build a model and test it in repeatable situations. You can tweak various parameters over and over again. You sit there, scratch your head. Remember in, in this, you know, science discovery, the most important phrase isn't Eureka. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Let me go and think about that. You can do it over and over again. This is, the tool, this is a proper research tool. And so you can do things that would normally, again, kill yourself in the safety of your lab. Huge advances. And, and NACA was the largest operator of wind tunnels in the world. Large number of them at Langley, but they were scattered around lots of research institutes. Even the Wright brothers had built one. Believe it or not, Langley built one, but it wasn't really a wind tunnel, but it had the right ideas. But in order for the Wright brothers to figure out how wings work, because they were just looking at birds, trying to figure out, oh, well, bird wing looks like this. I'll build something like this. How well does it work? They found all the data that had been built up to that time was all wrong. So they had to start from scratch. They had to do their basic research. This is the flaw of Samuel Langley. He didn't question published research. He was a researcher. He figured all the data was good. The data was bad. And it was only with the, um, uh, uh, the idea that they were able to come up with their own analytics that they were able to succeed. And it was pretty primitive. It had a little fan in the front. And they put their test sections at the other end. And they were able to get enough data to build their uh, flying machine. Things kind of got bigger. This is, this is the full-size tunnel. They, 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 you'll never find wind tunnels this big anymore. This was actually torn down about 10 years ago. But they wanted to investigate the problems of flight in existing airplanes. Not new designs, but existing ones. We could hark, you know, the aviation engines were getting bigger and bigger. Why aren't my planes going faster? Yeah, you might max out at 120, 130, maybe miles an hour, but you weren't getting much more. Almost, because, almost in spite of the fact you're putting pretty good size engines in there. Take a little look at that airplane that they're testing. It's called a Vought Corsair. We'll get, we're going to get back to it. We look at these airfoils, much more sophisticated than what the Wright brothers did, but the same basic concept. How does a wing, an airfoil, and look at that shape. It's a very special shape. Here we have the wind flowing over a wing when it's in what we call a stall. When it's not generating lift, it's now pitching up so much, like a plane going up, that now the airflow separates, starts bubbling around, and you lose all your lift. This is how people get killed. If your wing isn't flying, then, you might as well, you know, then there's no reason for your wings. When does that happen? What does it look like? What's the controllability when you're in a stall? This is huge fundamental research that you have to do in order to understand this aeroplane that you're building. This ought to catch your eye. We think of, especially when you get on a modern airliner, those things are pretty rugged, aren't they? It's tough to think of. Fine fun ways of breaking them. I mean, yeah, when we fly, we might see the wing go up and down a little bit. You can't build a wing, for example, that is perfectly sturdy. 
You can't build a wing that is so strong it can't flex. Well, you can, but it would be incredibly impractical. Yeah, you could do steel I-beams and all the rest, but you'll never get the plane off the ground. And so you have to accept a little bit of what we call elasticity. It will bend. Lots of times you want something like that. If you have a gust or something, you don't want the wing to break off. You want to flex, deal with it, and continue on. So, what we found is that when you have things moving through a fluid, and a fluid in physics can be defined as gas, like air, or water. Fluids are a very generic name for these kind of things. You get into a resonance where the bending of the airplane starts to constructively interfere or constructively build on the motions, on, on, on the different turbulent little spirals of air coming by. This can grow and grow and grow to the point where the airplane is destroyed. Wait, can you that? What, happens then? what happens is that now we're in a world where we have structures that will bend. They're not perfectly stiff. And so as they start bending, it changes the aerodynamics a little bit. We have a concept we call resonance where, uh, and, and in a sense, it's almost like playing a chord you can, or playing music. If the wave fronts are perfectly lined up, it'll be much louder. If they're, perf if they're perfectly 180 degrees out of phase, you'll hear nothing. This resonance is when they're all in phase, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. How bad is this? I, I, was going, I, I, I was going to play a video of it, but that's exactly constructive interference resonance. But I've got an even scarier video. Because we've, we've all seen the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, Galloping Gertie. The bridge is just flopping up and down. That was bad. We lo at least no one died. Two Lockheed Electras. Again, this is in the early 50s, I think. Flying along, perfectly happy, completely self-destructed in there. Lots of lives lost. They find parts scattered miles away from the crash site. So they know it broke up, but they're looking at all the pieces. And it's like nothing is rotted. Well, it was all metal, but there's no reason. I mean, this, this aircraft is a good aircraft. Why did it break up? It's a phenomenon called flutter. This, is one of, this was a huge part of research in the 50s, when, especially when the uh, uh, electrodes went in. It was known for years. But it became really deadly. Is this it? Yeah. You want to see the results of flutter? These, these models are aero uh, effectively the same scale and flexibility. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the same flexibility, they scale them. There's wonderful ways of doing that as a real live aircraft. And there are videos that you'll see where the real aircraft are having these problems. This is not, this is not made out of rubber. There's a great shot of a sailplane doing exactly this. Well, that's a scary way to do it. Uh, uh, yeah. Perfectly good airplane. And with all the scaling laws, this is the same stiffness in the real aircraft. You wonder why they bend airplane wings as much as they do during testing. Well, Mom, what happened to my tail? I don't know why this is in segments. Maybe they just wanted to look at it a little closer. Yeah, this is flutter. Pardon? Just their flight. Just yep. Flying. Flying. They're not doing anything terrible. But there are certain regions of controllability where it has a bad day. How do you fix it? Slow down. Or speed up. 
Remember, you're at that sweet spot. So, how do you address that? Well, since stiffness of your wing, elasticity is a function, also whatever natural frequencies the bending is, if you can change any of those variables, you've solved for that region of, of flying your flutter problem. Um, oops. Sorry. Here we go. Kind of a familiar airplane. Had a flutter problem. 747s. The solution was to put roughly half a ton of depleted uranium in the wings. It changed the frequency just enough. I used to fly, I, I used to have a marvelous little Cessna, a little two seat Cessna, a little 150. You go, oh, well, that's not a 747, that's not any of these jet things. Even on a 1,600 pound Cessna, I have weights in my ailerons just so that it breaks that resonant frequency and my wings don't fall off. Even in a 50, well, now it would be 60 year old Cessna. Doesn't that just change the frequency though? But if you miss that sweet spot, if now you've moved that resonance to 150 miles an hour and my plane can only go 100, I'm okay. okay. I'm okay. As long as I don't hit 150 or whatever the number is. I, I have no idea what it is. But yeah, you look at it when, you, when you do your pre flight, you have to make certain your lead weights are in there. Okay. Simple solution. Well, you can bet lots of equations were grand. So, anyway, so flutter was one of the things that they really had to deal with. But moving back a little bit, what did NACA do? The cowlings around the engines. We're going to get into this with a picture a little bit better. We couldn't get airplanes to go much faster than 120, 130. I mean, this is when speed records were broken at 200, and it was like huge engines and, you know, take out everything that doesn't look like an airplane, that sort of thing. It was a drag problem. Drag is just like when you stick your hand out of your car going 60 miles an hour. If you turn your hand like that, you have less drag, less resistance. Turn it like this, you're slowing down or you're not going to be able to go as fast. Engine placement, which should be something simple. You look at an airplane, that's where the engines go, right? Wrong. Didn't seem so obvious back in the day. NASA uh, didn't do anything as far as inventing swept wings. But they're the ones who did the, anal uh, the analytical work. Believe it or not, it was all done by some Irishman. Right after the first war, the, uh, the Germans did marvelous work. And yeah, well, we just basically took their research and did fun things with it. Area of rule sounds real esoteric, and it kind of is, but there's great stories. This is a storytelling lecture, I'll tell you. OK, remember that airplane in that big wind tunnel a couple slides back? This is, uh, uh, we're not beating up on Vought, which was a major aircraft manufacturer, but uh, just because the pictures are there and I could get a good one. This is a great bad example. What's wrong with that airplane that keeps it from going fast? Any thoughts? Those things around the engine. Can I find the propeller? Those little pointy, not pointy things, but these little things that hanging out here. Right up in there, all around the engine. Cylinders? The, cylinders? I, I, again, I, are those cylinders? Those are the cylinders. You have an air-cooled engine. You need airflow to cool the cylinders. Wouldn't it be smart if you just hung the cylinder out, let the breeze go and cool your engine? Brilliant. I mean, that is so intuitive, right? Duh. OK. Yeah. What else do you notice? For starts, yeah. Those things are hanging out. You don't use them when you're flying. You use them for takeoff and landing, but you don't use them when you're flying. They're just hanging out there. Also, believe it or not, a huge source of drag, the wires bracing the wings. A round cross-section, a wire, is the equivalent of a streamlined strut or streamlined wire 10 times thicker. Huge amounts of drag. This is a drag machine. 
And I'm not picking on this. All the, this is a contemporary, this is a well-engineered aircraft. They sold uh, you know, hundreds of them um, back in the day. It's just I have a good picture of it. Uh, but this is a picture of all the things that are wrong if you want to go fast. Well, there's even a bigger problem. Port train motor, you probably have heard of these things. Absolutely classic. Now they have a single wing. It was built like a tank, comparatively. But it's still got all those cylinders exposed. It's still got the landing gear hanging out and adding to all that drag. At least it doesn't have the wires. But the other thing, see where the engines are? They're just hanging under the wing. It turns out that is the draggiest and most inefficient, inefficient place to put an engine for a prop plane. So now we got three things wrong. At least we don't have those wires flying back and forth. We got our gear hanging out. We have our exposed cylinders. And we have me tripping over the chair. And you have these engines hanging under the wing. That was a very normal configuration. That was aviation. They got smart. Get the wheels up. Between the wheels and the drag around the engines, that was 40 to 70% of all the drag in the airplane. That's huge. And a big chunk of the rest of it was the placement of the engines. This is a great bad example. It was contemporary engineering at the time. They didn't see anything wrong with it. We got it right. Actually, believe it or not, everyone talks about the DC-3. Boeing was actually the one who built a predecessor to it, separate, separate company. But you notice the wheels are all tucked up. We have, you notice how there's a cover around those cylinders, around the engines? That force, it's actually a small airfoil inside. That forces the flow of air over the cylinders. Turns out the engines get cooled a huge amount better, and that's 40% of your drag, right there. That is just the right way of shrouding the engines, keeping those exposed, very lots of parts, moving stuff out of the airflow, doing it nice and controlled. You get better cooling, you get less drag. How can you lose? Oh, and you notice now we put the engines in front of the wings and the props. This was, this was the re one of the many reasons why it was successful was that this had almost every major aviation advance for the day. Absolutely amazing. I mean, if it, again, it's 80 years old now, something like that, 90 almost. And there's flying examples. And it still holds up today. So now we want to go faster than sound. Well, that's kind of hard. We have all kinds of interesting things. We didn't know how to even build a wind tunnel. How do you do supersonic trying to push it through a tunnel? That was a tough one. And the tunnels that they had weren't very, very good. Lots of times they literally fired a model of the plane out of a gun because that was the only way they could get it fast enough to study all the shock and all the rest. A weird thing, your pressure distributions on the plane totally change. Lots of planes, especially the early supersonic ones, because now your pressure and your balance and all the rest are different, they have to start moving fuel back and forth to rebalance the plane. Otherwise, you pop your nose up and, well, that's a bad idea. Concorde was famous for that. Hugely complex fuel system because as you're going through the speed of sound, you have to move all your fuel to the back of the plane. As you slow down, what's left, you have to bring up front. Very common solution. Had to figure it out in the wind tunnels so that you could see these distributions and all the rest. And your plane handle's totally different. So, how do we go through all this stuff? So this, is, this is what that high-speed flight station, the Edwards Air Force Base, yes, the guys who did the right stuff. All done here. High-speed flight, first, uh, the X-1, Chuck Yeager. First time through the speed of sound, just barely. But he did it. And boy, did we find problems. Again, they're doing the best they can, but a lot of this stuff doesn't work. Or it exposes characteristics that we're not really thinking would even happen. It was all brand new. Something called inertial coupling. 
not going to get into it. It has to do with moments of inertia and as you roll and transfer of momentum and all the rest. But basically, we're comfortable with the idea of a plane. If you want to turn, you go like this. That's the way the book is written. That's, that's the way I learned how to fly. Well, it turns out at speeds, at high speeds and high a lot of other things, if you do this, your plane pitches up and yaws to the other way. Lots, you know, you hear of the right stuff and all the guys that died, a big chunk of them were because of this. What the heck is happening? This is a phenomenon they did not understand or expect. Huge issues. It has to do with small wings and long pointy airplanes, which is the way you want to build a supersonic plane. So we had to start researching. We made a whole bunch of airplanes. Some were rocket powered because the engines of the day weren't that good. Lots of times we put it under a B-52, dropped it, they fired the rocket engine, if only just to get up to those kind of speeds. We didn't have jet engines like we do today. So we built a whole lot of them. There was probably a dozen, two dozen different research airplanes, each looking at a different aspect of flight, a different aspect of the problem. Sometimes you have to specially design something in order to look at the one problem without all the other variables interfering. And it wasn't, and, you know, they're doing great things, but they're not just trying to break records, although that was always fun. Yeah, you know, this was understanding fundamental problems of flight. We had to figure all this stuff out. So, here was one of them. Oh, and we're doing okay on time. Here was one of them. Area rule. Anyone, have, have, anyone even hear of this? Supersonic flight. Tough, tough problem. You're trying to go faster than sound. You're going so fast, or want to go so fast, the air can't get out of the way. You get this huge problem of huge amounts of drag. At the time, we couldn't really build engines that good to get us up through brute force, like a rocket engine, for an operational aircraft in, you know, in the Air Force. What we find, again, you don't know this until you, know, you have to research it, and then the answer is more of a surprise than you think. If you take a look at an airplane from the top, we can talk about how much area there is in the wings, for example. On a boat, you might want to talk the wetted area of the part of the hull that's going through the water. Important variables. In supersonic flight, the bulk of the drag, the thing that's slowing you down, trying to keep you from going supersonic, is a very different thing. Total surprise. Think of a cross section, vertical. You, know, you have an airplane, cut it vertically. Add up that area, cross sectional area. That's where the dominant, that's where the dominant drag comes from is a function of how big the cross section is of the airplane. That's a huge, huge discovery. Sounds pretty esoteric. Sounds like a lot of guys, you know, happily grinding equations. We have a case study. F-102, Century Series. Okay, this is my era. My dad flew this. Boy, doesn't this look great. The whole idea that, you know, now it's the Cold War, we have Russian bombers potentially coming over. We need to get a supersonic plane up, shoot the bad guys down, etc. cetera. Gotta go faster, you know, you know, because, you know, we meet them far away, well, it saves everyone. Smart ideas, all of it. And boy, something, look, you know, again, this is early 50s. If I was in a Russian bomber seeing a bunch of these come up, I mean, it is a sweet looking airplane. Yeah, I'd be scared to death. That thing looks like a million bucks, costs lots of millions. This was the state of the art. Supersonic interceptors. Think of that. If there was a problem, it wouldn't go supersonic. They couldn't get that thing, you know, the way you design it is that you wanted to go like Mach one and a half, one and a half times the speed of sound. It couldn't even come close to Mach one. 
in the most polite words, it was a dog. We talk today about airplanes that, oh, well, they're not up to snuff. They're, you know, the, the contractor is an idiot. He's costing us too much. This was an abject failure after spending millions of dollars, millions of 1950s dollars, that meant something. It didn't work. They had, to get, they had to get the proverbial clean sheet of paper and start it all over again. Because now, we have this thing called an area rule. And the heck is that? Again, remember what the idea of an area is cross-section. I want to have a constant for constant drag, I want to have it to be constant no matter which slice I take vertically. Now, if I have just a tube across section, it's all the same, right? But you have these, you know, unsightly things called wings. That adds to that. So every place there's a wing, you're getting a bigger and bigger area. Something's got to give. They were going to just modify this airplane. And again, it looked like, you know, again, 1950, something like that coming at you, pff, I'd turn around. Turns out, not that, not that uh, if you had a fast jet, you could easily outrun this. This is not going to go. The modifications were so radical, they'd stop calling it an F-102. And they came up with this. The 106. My dad flew this for a decade. All of my family friends, all, my, you know, all the kids I hung out with, everyone drove one of these. This is called the ultimate interceptor. The F-102 lasted 8, 10 years. This lasted 35. They finally, you know, it's, they started building them in 56. They finally retired them in uh, 89. I was almost run over by one in my Cessna. We were kind of like, the frigate's that. Well, I was going like this. He was going like that. Take a look at the fuselage. Take a look at the body. As the thickness, overall thickness, of the wings change, something had to give. And we contour the fuselage in. It's almost sensuous. They call it a Coke bottle shape or something politically correct or wasp waist. We started with an airplane that couldn't even go six, seven hundred miles an hour. This one, in 1959, broke and still holds the single engine speed records, going from 600 miles an hour in the old version to 1,525. It's dramatic. And after 60 years, is that right? Yeah, 60 years, that plane still holds the record. They did good work. Now they have to put more engines on them but to do the same thing. But that was the most advanced aircraft around. Incredible digital control, 1950s. We'll talk about Sage you know, some other time. If you're into computers, we could talk all day because it was frightening. My dad was like totally overwhelmed by it. But that was the state of the art in aircraft design. And it lasted in the inventory 35 years. This is why we had when we had our F-15s and our F-16s and our F-22. Well, maybe not the F-22. This was still the frontline interceptor for the country. Pretty nifty toy. But wings get in the way, don't they? We don't need no stinking wings. Right? What the heck you need? All right, come on. What do you need wings for? Lift. All right, I'll give you a lift. Uh, yeah, lift. lift. Lift is a good thing, right? We'll, we'll all agree you want to have lift if you're in an airplane. Do you really need lift? Well, yeah, you do. Yeah. What would happen if you decided to dispense with wings? Again, these are researchers. That's a good question. It's like, what happens if you wrap the engine in a cowling or put it in front of whatever or all the other great fundamental questions? 
don't have the drag of wings, don't have any lift. But what happens if you can arrange the shape of the aircraft to generate its own lift without wings? Hmm. $75,000 question. How well does it work? And they built a lot of variants of these. This was in the 60s. And because you're generating lift from the body of the plane, we have a lifting bot. All right, you get it. Anyway, so the whole body of the aircraft is generating lift as best it can. How do you control something like that? I'm real comfortable with the idea with wings that have twisty things on them that make me turn and go up and down and all the right. What happens if you don't have those? How do you control something like that? They went through a whole lot of stuff. If you know the, and unfortunately, shoestring budgets being what they are, controllability stunk. Really, because it was, you know, if you don't have lots of moment arms to, on your wings, it's tough to control roll. And yeah, a few of them. We all know opening scenes from Six Million Dollar Man. That was the center one. Is that plane right? Yeah. M2, F2. Horrible, horrible aircraft. But the guy lived. Seriously, he did. But yeah, the M2, F2, center one. That's what, uh, it was a bad day at work. They were seriously thinking in the decade before they did the, they finished the serious research that these this is those uh, vehicles were going going to be how you shuttle back and forth to space even years before you called anything a space shuttle it made sense why do you have to have wings in space they're just dead weight dead weight costs a lot and a lot of energy to get the machine up let's see what we can do without it very interesting thoughts but no pun, the apex of it all. This was probably the most influential piece of research that now we're into the NASA days. NASA was created in 58, right around the time the X-15 was. This was designed to go fast, go high, go hot. These are the three things you have to do or understand if you're going to be having any kind of reusable aircraft, aircraft, spacecraft, going up. I got my Cessna down. I was going maybe, a, I might have gone 100 miles an hour. It's not too hot to touch, except on a hot summer day. When you start getting hot, going faster and faster, between the compression of the air and the friction of the air, Things get hot. That F-106, when the guy landed, his windows were shattered. His paint was gone. And he was, let's just say, the plane needed a big overhaul when it was done. But it made it. But now we have to design to survive these environments. We didn't have, like the space shuttle does, and they actually worked extraordinarily well, fancy tiles or carbon carbon and all the rest. You had to design and invent metals that could survive 1,000 degrees, even more. We talk that steel doesn't melt until, what, 1,500, 2,000, or some very large number, way outside the numbers we would deal with in high-speed flight. But the problem is steel loses its strength around 800 degrees. And there's a great video of this guy who's trying to prove a point, and there's a good point, is that he puts an iron bar or steel bar into his little furnace that he keeps, just lets it sit, doesn't even get spectacularly hot, and then he's just able to bend it. And this was one inch thick, you know, carbon steel. So you gotta have something that will be strong through huge temperatures. And we had to invent new alloys. There's now a whole generation of what we call super alloys, ink canals. There's a lot of others that retain their strength 1,500 degrees. Because when this came back, it got really hot. And we had no way to insulate. So the entire plane was just, we call it a hot structure. The space shuttle, because of the tiles, just has bare aluminum underneath it. That melts or gets useless at around 400. So. Those tiles worked very well. Here you didn't have that luxury. The whole plane was glowing. 
So the idea is, what does it, if, if just flying around at normal airplane speeds, jetliner speeds, is a crazy proposition, and now just getting through the a sound barrier is a crazy proposition. We're exploring all kinds of flight that we've never even heard of, or we have to figure out because we never could imagine it. What happens when you go, you know, 2,000, 3,000 miles an hour? How did things change? We had no idea. We knew enough to know we didn't know. And boy, do they change. In the process, yeah, we broke altitude records. There was over a dozen guys that got asked, or uh, a dozen flights, four or five guys, that got astronaut wings and went that high, over 50 miles. People argue 62 is the limit, but the Air Force said 50 miles, that was it. Now, when you go up that high, you're flying an airplane. There isn't any air. How do you control things that have wings that there's no air for the wings to work on? You need to have, and they develop, little rocket engines in the wings and nose, all the rest, to maneuver. Today we call it a reaction control system, required on every spacecraft. They had to learn how to use them. The important thing was that, oh, and, you know, now we have to deal with heating. Turns out one of the, uh, it was carrying an experiment the shock waves interfered with everything to the point where large sections of this incredible super alloy were all melted. We call it shock shock interaction. This is serious stuff. You just can't hang stuff on things and go that fast and expect it to be benign. It's pretty ugly. And the research from this was directly, even though the space shuttle hadn't been really designed, all that data was completely transferable to the space shuttle. Now think of it, you're trying to enter the Earth at Mach 25, whatever Mach means in an area that doesn't have any air. We've only gone up to maybe Mach 6.5 in the air. So let's just say the brilliance of the space shuttle, because they had no wind tunnels, no nothing for this, was a huge leap of faith in extrapolating your data. That was the brilliance of the shuttle, the fact that they did it only a little bit over budget. The shuttle was on budget, mostly. People don't realize that. It was only 15% over budget. Uh, the fact that they could take these huge leaps was nothing short of amazing. So in order to look at all these different regimes of flight, you couldn't do all of them at the same time. You couldn't do a heating test at the same time you wanted to go super, super fast, at the same time you wanted to go super high. So, you had different profiles. One of them is you went up high. 400,000 feet, just about 350 or something like that. No air, no controllability in traditional airplane terms. And so you're able to evaluate those things. We had to invent new stabilization systems to control it because you're used to wings and all the rest. Well, no, all those rules are gone now. And then, of course, have to quickly transform once you start getting down to a regular airplane. Then you do the speed runs. You don't go nearly as high. You use all your energy just to go fast. And then you want to test for heating. You go up and then just plunge, not straight down, but a lot steeper angles. So every, even though they had 200 missions of the X-15, each one was looking, did a different profile, looking at different aspects of the problem. And sometimes for the really long, high-powered ones, we had to coat, you know, we're used to seeing the X-15 all black. We had to coat it in a heat protective layer, strap on extra fuel tanks in order to get to these incredibly uh, tough boundaries. So, you know, the usual nonsense, controllability, blah, blah, blah. A throttleable rocket engine. Normally, you know, especially in those days, you through a switch, the rocket engine went on, you flip the switch the other way, the rocket engine goes off. That seems pretty simple. But they wanted aircraft-like response. And so, in the late 50s, they invented an engine, a rocket engine that could throttle across a rather huge thing. We didn't have anything really similar to that until the space shuttle. Interesting stuff. Also had to really refine spacesuits. They were so scared of fire that they flooded the cockpit, not with air, but with nitrogen. 
can't breathe that. I mean, we're breathing it, but we have oxygen as well. And so you had to be in a sealed spacesuit the entire time. Plus, the, with that hot structure, even the windows got hundreds of degrees, and you had to have yourself protected. And the last thing. God, we're actually on time. I can't believe this. Sonic boom research. Now, see, NASA isn't just flying faster, higher, you know, hotter, all the rest. They're doing stuff that's directly applicable today. We could spend another day talking about everything from the aircraft control advances and all the rest. But these are just the highlights. Concorde was probably the sexiest airplane that they could put wings on. Absolutely breakthrough for its time. I mean, it was just gorgeous to see. I mean, it was, it was the future. It really was. Oh, it was horribly inefficient. It sucked gas, like, well, far too much. But the big thing that killed it, or one of the big things, aside from affordability, all the rest. Believe it or not, British Airways always made money, or most of the time they made money on it, once it went into service. You have these sonic booms. Now, again, I was, I'm an Air Force brat, so I lived around airports, and, ex and when I was living in, in the desert near Edwards, you're constantly boom, boom. You have a sonic boom that comes close to your house. Yes, it will break you know, windows and crack plaster and all the rest. This isn't just like a thunderclap goes boom. And do that over day in, day out. The locals are going to get real upset. Not only that, if you're flying coast to coast, you have a long swath of folk over you know, multiple miles wide the entire distance. So all supersonic flight civilian is banned. Can't do it. Not only no, but hell no. Just about every country has it. Yes? Well, you, oh, and that's what they had to do. The reason why the Concorde is only allowed, uh, the only routes it was allowed were, okay, it leaves from London or Paris, it flies subsonic over the continents, and then once it hits water, that's when it does its speed dash. But if you want to go New York to Los Angeles, or if you want to go London to, I don't know, Rome, or something like that, you're going to get a lot of people irritated along that ground. Sir? Is it true that the Concorde was so completely inefficient that if for some reason it couldn't land at Kennedy, it had one shot at Newark and that was it? No. No? No. It, 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 it landed at Kennedy for a few years. In fact, it just went right into my house. Yeah. It was subsonic about 30 miles offshore. Then when it flew, it came up to my house. Yeah. I did see it land in Newark, though. Oh, I'm sure it did. Uh, I thought it had one shot at Newark. Oh, no, no. It just uh, didn't have enough fuel. And the Concorde was not an exception. Uh, and this, is, this was true with my Cessna. It's true with the 747. You are required to have enough fuel to get to your destination. Then, at your destination, go to your alternate, and then have 45 minutes of flight. And even, uh, granted, it would be subsonic, but if they were having a problem over the ocean, the first stop they'd make is Gander, Newfoundland. And that would cut a huge amount of time off. You know, when, when, when we had 9-11 and the airspace was shut down, there's, there's a wonderful book out. It's a tearjerker. It's a fabulous book about people coming out. Uh, when we closed the airspace for 9-11, every transatlantic flight ended up at, at Gander. Now, my dad was stationed at Gander. It's a little one-horse, nothing town population. Yeah, Gander. Uh, it's in uh, uh, Newfoundland. I'm sorry, no, no, it's in Labrador, close to the Arctic Circle. It's a lousy assignment, but good flying. Um, and there's a huge, huge air base there. It used to be, again, Air Defense Command for Canada and the US. And that is your go to if you have to get the plane on the ground. And, don't, and you don't want to wait until you get to Kennedy or Boston and all the rest. It's, it's, it's the first stop. And uh, for 9-11, again, there's a book. I forget what it's called. This is way off topic. But now you have 40 jetliners all full of people at this strategic, like a strategic air command base in a town of maybe 1,000. 
and the entire town comes out, puts everyone up. They might have had to stack people like cordwood. There isn't a grocery store to handle thousands of people, so some people had food airlifted in. It's a wonderful, st and they had to stay there for four days until, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, the airspace that opened up in the U.S. It's a wonderful people story. They ought to make it into a movie. They probably will. And it's a great read. It really is. And I forget the name of the book. Come from away? Sorry? Does it come from away? You know, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. But it's a great read. And if you want to talk about the generosity of people, and, you know, you, we can joke about Canada or not joke about Canada. Imagine if all of us, you know, could you imagine knuckleheads in New Jersey bringing in complete sight on, uh, didn't, don't speak the language. They might be coming from Italy. Don't speak the language. Putting up half a dozen or a dozen people in a little house because they have no place to go. Wonderful, wonderful stories. Great stuff. So anyway, we're going to finish up and then we'll talk all the books and fun stuff. So the whole thing is, if you want to have a supersonic flight, you can't have a sonic boom, or at least one that's objectionable. And believe me, if, if you've been under a real sonic boom, it will hurt. I had an F4 go over and, yeah, they gave out earplugs before they did it, seriously, and you needed them. Yeah, that's just not that's just not acceptable. So, this is what, and they're building this right now. They actually have built a prototype before it actually modified an existing plane. How do you get rid of that sonic boom? You know the first picture that was gorgeous. That's going to be my new wallpaper. Uh, you see all the shock waves coming off. What we've learned is if you have a long pointy nose, shock waves are caused by a big structure trying to get air out of the way. But if you gradually, like a hypodermic needle, slide through in a small cross section, it's not nearly as bad. This is what we call low boom, not zero. But the preliminary research that they've done works. It really, really does. And so they're going to build a full-size demonstrator that's being constructed right now. And they're going to run to see if this is the, what the future of supersonic flight over populated areas looks like. My shockwave pictures. That's it. And I'm on time. Thank you.